Nejat ilk gelen. <gülüyor> Okay, I think we're ready to go, right? Okay. All right, well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Ipek Gözmoğlu. I am the director of Kema Modern Turkish Studies program here at North Northwestern University. And um, I'd like to welcome you all and thank you all for joining us today for this uh, exciting talk. And um, before uh, we start, I'd like to take a second and uh, remind you that our next Zoom event, uh, many of our events are taking place over Zoom. Uh, and the next one is a round table on the upcoming elections in Turkey. Uh, Everybody is, of course, talking about this and we and we have a, you know, fantastic lineup of people who, who are going to be discussing it. And that is going to take place next Wednesday, same time, same format. And um, we also have another, you know, lineup of events uh, all the way into June. I'm not going to announce every single one of them here, but we are going to put a link to our website. And um, if you go there, you can find information. And um, like I said, many of these will be taking place over Zoom. And if you happen to be on campus, we also have a few events coming up um, in person that will take place in, in person now that we pretend to uh, pandemic is is over well i mean we can interact socially um so some of you are I, i'm guessing i'm looking at the names here that you are familiar with our programming and um i know that you have been following our talks um even conferences and um, you may know that in addition to these uh, regular uh, events, we also uh, have uh, a talk series based on a specific theme. Uh, and we try to change the theme. Uh, and we try to make sure that these are uh, issues, themes that, you know, that are really pressing. that occupy us uh, not only as academics, but also as members of the public, they're relevant to us all. And this year's theme uh, will be, and this is going to continue into the next academic year, by the way. Uh, the theme is unruly ecologies in the Ottoman Empire and Turkey. And um, we uh, settled on this theme before the earthquakes and um, it turned out to be unfortunately, tragically prescient. Um, as you all know, the time period that we call the Anthropocene has entered a phase when its impact, it's you know mostly negative impact on of human activity on the environment, geography and the earth resources um, Uh, it's undeniable and it's also palpable in our everyday lives. It's, you know, hopefully it's not the last phase of the Anthropocene, but it is that, you know, intense change uh, period. During this time of intensifying ruination and disasters on a global scale, this series will explore the politics of ecology and its limits. We will identify and reflect on the ways in which ecological landscapes and the attempts to shape and control them help us understand region making, state formation, capitalist disposition, community building and destruction, and the moral economy of human, human intervention into the environment. And today it is my privilege to introduce to you the inaugural speaker uh, of the series, Dr. Erdem Evren. Dr. Evren is a political and economic anthropologist who divides his time between Berlin and Istanbul. He received his PhD from the Middle Eastern Politics uh, Department or program at Freie Universität uh, Berlin. And he is currently working as an adjunct instructor at the University of Bremen and, uh, and Bosphorus University or Bosch University in Istanbul. His next research project will study how the narratives, policies, and practices that develop around the demands for sustainability transform the hazelnut 
frontiers in <clears throat> Turkey and Italy. So all the Nutella pins out there, it's, you know, it's for you. And, uh, but today uh, he's going to be presenting from his first project and his first monograph. Um, this is a book titled Bulldozer Capitalism, Accumulation, Ruination, and Disposition in Northeastern Turkey, which was published by Bergen Books in 2022. So it's, you know, hot off the press. And um, this is a book set in the resource frontier of northeastern Turkey, namely Yusufeli uh, Artvin. It studies the rise and decline of an anti-dam, anti-displacement campaign, and the political responses to other extractive projects that it helped to shape in its aftermath. It shows that people can accommodate their own disposition and displacement if they are directed to negotiate, invest in, and speculate on the destruction of their built environment and nature. And um, our commentator today and moderator is our very own Dr. Ekin Kurtic. Um, she also, I have to know, she also con con conceived the, the theme for this talk series. She is a social cultural anthropologist. Uh, she graduated from Harvard in 2019 and following a two year, right? Two year stint at Brandeis as a junior research fellow at the Crown Center for Middle East uh, for Middle East Studies. She joined our community here at Northwestern, and she is currently working on a monograph on a related topic, and it's uh, tentatively titled Sedimented Landscapes, Building Dams, Restoring Ecologies in the Choruk Basin, which critically examines state-led state projects of restoring and salvaging nature in the process of large dam building in, in Turkey. So it can, I just leave it to you from now on. <laughs> you can take it from here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ipek, for this uh, amazing introductions. And I'm basically immediately open the floor, give the floor to Dr. Erdam Evran uh, for his presentation. And afterwards I will follow with uh, my commentary. Um, thank you. Um, I would like to thank Ipek and Ikin uh, for kindly inviting me to take part in this lecture series and for giving me the opportunity to um, present my book. Um, so in this talk, I'll take you through some of the main arguments of bulldozer capitalism, and then I guess we'll continue with um, Ikin's comments, and then I guess we'll have a Q&A. Um, but let me begin with the beginnings of this journey that ended uh, with this book with bulldozer capitalism. So let me share this. Um, so can you see it? Yeah, okay. So um, around 2010, 2011, um, as I was finishing my PhD dissertation on a completely different topic, I began to closely follow the news coming from Turkey about, um, about a number of local struggles and campaigns against energy and infrastructural projects in Turkey. In, Turkey. Um, in virtually every corner of Turkey's countryside, local people were protesting against the construction of hydropower and coal burning plants, the opening of mining facilities, and the establishment of electricity transmission lines. And some of these struggles were quite intense. In some cases, people were clashing with the police or the gendarmerie for hours. In some cases, they were burning construction vehicles. And in virtually every single village or in every single town, there was a campaign going on against um, um, extraction or, or infrastructural projects. And they were also bringing court cases against the companies and the states. And the social and political composition of these campaign struggles were also quite interesting and unusual. Uh, so in 
without an exception, all these places, men and women, farmers and pensioners, old and young were struggling against these projects uh, together. And in many places, leftist groups, leftist organizations, socialists were also uh, by and large part of these campaigns. So like most lefty academics, activists um, from Turkey, I was quite intrigued by the intensity and prevalence of these struggles. And I um, traveled around in, to, in the end of 2011, I traveled around uh, the Eastern Black Sea region for two weeks, uh, this area which had already become the, uh, the center of these struggles, again, especially those struggles against the construction of small scale hydro hydroelectric power plants or HES projects, as we see in Turkish. So what I learned, especially in the uh, coastal towns of the Eastern Black Sea region is that, um, that the state had leased the use rights of rivers or river parts to private, private companies for the construction of these facilities for 49 years. And uh, like privatization, ecological devastation, loss of water, destruction of land, enclosure of the commons were some of the main grievances animating uh, these groups mobilizing against these projects. But, um, so this is what we are talking about. Further um, south, an hour and a half hours away from the regional capital, Artvin, uh, I found that a much grimmer future was awaiting the town of Yusufile. I learned that during this trip, uh, with the construction of the Yusufili Dam project, the entire town center, its 17 villages and nearly all agricultural lands uh, would be submerged. Um, and thousands of people were expected to be displaced as a result of this uh, project. Now, um, Yusufili was very different from the other places that I've seen in the uh, in, in this region uh, for several reasons. First of all, this is a Megadam project. So this is, by the way, Yusufilia. Uh, or this was Yusufilia, we'll come to that. <laughs> um, first of all, this is a Megadam project, a project that was planned as part of the Çoruk Energy Plan, uh, which includes the construction of 10 uh, large, 10 uh, big dams on the main tributary of the Çoruk River. And uh, starting from early 1990s, the entire valley was more or less consecutively dammed. And the Yusufili project was the tallest dam planned as part of the Çoruk Energy Plan. And as such, uh, it was uh, the most destructive one in terms of its environmental effects. Um, second, um, the people that I met in Yusufili already in this initial trip, but also later on, uh, the residents were actually by and large uh, quite conservative and nationalist and pro-AKP, pro-Justice and Development Party. And uh, anti-dam activists, anti-displacement activists that I met uh, were also coming from ultra-nationalist circles, like from MHP, BBP, and so on and so forth, so forth which was uh, really different than what I've uh, encountered in other parts of the Eastern Black Sea region. But um, more importantly, uh, I learned that Yusufili's residents had actually stopped the start of this project uh, for almost a decade. So when the project was first announced in 1997, like formally, uh, a local association was established uh, to save the town from submergence. And court cases were brought against various ministries, demonstrations were held, but also more interestingly, uh, there was an international side to the struggle that the local activists um, or some people from Yusufili who were living abroad uh, were also in touch with international NGOs and they worked together to stop the release of export credits to international consortiums who wanted to build this project. And actually, they were successful for about 10 years. And as a result, three international consortiums were forced to withdraw from the project one after another. 
But after the Justice and Development Party government, the AKP government nationalized the project in 2000, 2010 uh, by announcing that it will finance the project itself. Uh, the activist energy in the town gradually fizzled out to give way to different forms of negotiation with the state. And in 2013, uh, the tender was given to another consortium, this time a domestic one, formed of uh, the three largest construction companies uh, in Turkey uh, with close ties to the AKP government and the Erdogan family. Uh, namely Limak, Genghis, and Colin. Uh, and also around this time, uh, or a bit later, uh, a mayor from the AKP, from the Justice and Development Party, was elected in Yusufide. So the ethnographic question uh, that quickly came out uh, was this. So why did this campaign, why did this anti-dam, anti-displacement campaign uh, get defeated, even though its activists, activists managed to stop the start of construction for more than a decade? And uh, between 2012 and 2018, I spent a total of a year in Yusuf Ali to be able to uh, answer this question. Um, now, to be answered, to be able to answer this question in this book, I study politics in this resource frontier at the uh, intersections of infrastructure, economy, and identity. And I try to understand why and under what condition uh, the semi-rural community in Yusufili gradually began to give consent to and take part in a project that would result in its economic dispossession and displacement. And here, my theoretical inspiration comes from uh, Gramsci, or a particular reading of Gramsci by um, some anthropologists like Tanya Lee, Gavin Smith, etc. For Gramsci, politics is about the uh, capacity to engage in critical thought and action in the practices of everyday life. And embedded in the common sense in incoherent and contradictory ways, this embryonic form of critique can become historically effective according to Gramsci, only if it's rendered visible and societal forces are connected with one another. So what I really did in Bulldozer Capitalism was to explore the circumstances and forces that first enabled and then hindered people's capacity to forge connections and to make explicit their critical challenge against infrastructures, injuries, and injustices. And in each chapter, I laid down another piece of the puzzle concerning this shift from contesting this infrastructural project, Yusupili Dam project, to negotiating with and accommodating to capitalist developments. Um, so I'll go through some of the main arguments that came out. The first argument is capitalist development works on and through the desires of its target communities. Um, so this is this may seem very obvious to many of you, but especially the literature on large infrastructural projects is to this day very much inspired by James Scott's idea of high modernism in seeing like a state. So this idea that if you remember like grand schemes of improvement, severe local people from everyday forms of knowing and doing that have been central to their survival for centuries. And in the dam literature, mega dam literature, and even in uh, environmental humanities, like uh, for example, Rob Nixon uh, follows this. Um, so there is this um, idea of like pitting these ideas of progress, promises of progress against the indigenous, local, in many ways, self-contained co contained ways of living and knowing and people come up with uh, terms like surplus people or uninhabitants or something like that. But by contrast, what I argue is that um, infrastructural projects like the Yusufi Dam project actually fuel or activate people's aspirations to bring to life different kinds of value formation, such as employment, conspicuous consumption, and I'll come to that in a second, speculation. The other interesting thing is, or the other important issue for me is at what scale all this works? Like at what scale does capitalist development actually activate or animate people's aspirations and desires? 
Now, the anthropological literature uh, for a very long time has emphasized on the transnational context and transnational connections, and they've written on transnational NGOs, companies, uh, so on and so forth. Um, so what they argue, and like very different figures from Anna Singh to Don Kalp, they said that you know we should look at the international capital's interactions with the situated experiences, desires, or fears of people. So in other words, they were proposing to look at this within this global local nexus, like how capitalist development works, how it animates people, expectations, anticipations, desires within this global local nexus. I don't disagree with that, but in the context of Yusuf Ali and I think many other places, I think it's more correct to actually um, stress uh, the importance, the significance of other scalar constructs. And in my book, uh, one thing that I really write about is the national local nexus. So how the national, the idea of national actually in its economic, social, ideological inflections come to act on people's desires, people's expectations, people's fears, so on and so forth. Um, this makes sense because um, obviously after the nationalization of the Yusuf Ali Dam project, uh, the situation was quite different than what it was before under the um, transnational uh, regime of dam development under the time of the transnational or international consortiums. Now, there is a, also a political economic context that I uh, very much, uh, that I find very inspiring for my work, like the emergence or re-emergence of the national local ne nexus, if you like. And here I draw from the work of uh, Yahya Madra and Jeren Özsaçuk, who basically say that, um, it's a long argument, but who simply say that as a result, as a consequence of the global fluctuations uh, uh, of the global um, economic crisis of 2008, uh, basically capital began to flow from the, the uh, countries in the global north to the countries in the global south. Because in the global north, as we know, the Fed cuts interest rates, but whereas in countries like Turkey, Brazil, Argentina, whatever, uh, it suddenly became more profitable to uh, make money out of money. Now, their point is that this process or this um, political economic uh, structure had the effect of leading to the entrenchment of national sovereignty. It's basically made national governments, national leaders, national political parties more powerful, and they it basically gave them the opportunity to um, intervene in economic affairs in ways that they could not have uh, intervened in the past. Um, so this is basically the kind of the political economic context in which I talk about emergence or re-emergence of this nation local nexus. But just like most political economic explanations, this doesn't explain everything. Um, the other thing is that I see, uh, so I said that, you know, there has been this shift from a transnational to a national regime of dam planning and finance in the context of the Yusufili project, but this actually happened uh, in the case of several mega dam projects in the world, from India to Brazil to other places. And one of the things that I discuss in the book is that the shift is actually a consequence a result of a transnational anti-dam, anti-displacement movement struggle that took place throughout the 1990s, 1980s, 1990s, and 2000s. So um, they, these people, these different campaigns, including the Yusuf Ali campaign, actually pushed the uh, international donors to, like the World Bank, to come up with several guidelines concerning environmental protection, resettlement, uh, biodiversity in the case of Megadam projects. And this became much more costly. This became much more difficult for international export credit agencies to actually um, give those loans to the construction companies. And for that reason, uh, the international component of dam building has decreased quite drastically throughout the 2010s. And Yusuf Ali dam project is just one uh, example of that. 
Now, the following argument is that what I argue is that actually in this context, destruction itself becomes the conduit, uh, the medium for realizing economic and political desires. And here I engage with this literature on ruination. Um, ruination, you know, anthropologists use it or write about it a lot. It refers to uh, material devastation, the kind of emotions, effects that it elicit. Um, but what I do is that I specifically ask how ruinations, ruination also gets articulated with the strategies of accumulation and commodification and what sort of um, politics it all produces um, at the local level. level. Um, and one of the things that I write about in the book in quite detail is how the temporal and spatial structures of destruction or ruination actually become coextensive with visions and projects of investments. Now, um, Yusuf Ali's residents try to become not only wage laborers as construction workers, drivers, security personnel in the many dam, road, and um, tunnel projects that mushroomed in the Choruk Valley, especially after uh, 2010. Uh, what I found is that many of them also sought to tap into their surroundings devastation in order to bring their uh, bring to life their own visions of accumulation and commodification. So in some cases, this meant investing in or creating property for the purpose of uh, making a profit out of the uh, compensation economy. So um, despite the dam project or because of the dam project, depending on how you look at it, after 2015, Yusuf Ali was like a booming town. There were construction projects uh, going on in every single corner of the town center. Uh, like hundreds, I think 700 or 800 construction permits were issued by the uh, mayor for the construction of these new apartment buildings, more modern apartment buildings. And what was interesting is that people were building, the contractors were building, or the people were buying property, uh, mainly based on the expectation that they receive compensation payments after the expropriation of their properties. So it was an investment or it was a speculative investment, if you like. And the same thing was also happening in the villages that I visited. Uh, those people living in the villages were building greenhouses or barns, not for agriculture or not for animal husbandry, but precisely because they were expecting, they were anticipating to receive compensation payments um, for these properties. So this uh, future-oriented speculative investment on the coming destruction of the built environments nature and habitual ways of living is actually one of the uh, biggest themes themes that I explore in the book. But uh, there were other interesting things. Um, people were not only building or buying uh, flats, but uh, some people were also packaging those artifacts or representations of the vanishing present and the emotions that they elicit as commodities to be consumed in the future after the submergence of the town. So just to give two quick examples, I uh, regularly visited this one village half submerged uh, by the Derinar Dam project, another dam project in the, on the Choruk Valley. And the village had there, the Mukhtar, was um, collecting all sorts of artifacts, like utensils used to make wine and olive oil, like an old cradle, an old TV, and all sorts of things. And he was telling me that, you know, like once we have a new settlement area, um, I'm going to open an ethnographic museum here, and the tourists will come and uh, will make money. And he went as far as saying that I'm going to turn this village into the boardroom of the Eastern Black Sea region, uh, referring referring to the famous seaside resort in the south of Turkey. Or, for example, the mayor of Yusufeli has also very interesting ideas and projects with regards to packaging uh, the vanishing present for future consumption. 
Um, so he told me in one of our countless conversations that in the new settlement area, after the after Yusuf Ali gets submerged, he wants to uh, build what he calls Minia Yusuf Ali in the new settlement area, which is which was supposed to be uh, a scaled down version of the town right before it uh, becomes submerged with all the streets and buildings. And he would basically uh, hoping he was hoping that people would basically come to see the old Yusufili in this Minya Yusufili place, and they would pay money for that because he knew that people would uh, miss, people would be nostalgic for what um, they will be losing in the future. Now, um, what I'm saying is that even though several of these um, examples of what I call speculative accumulation or speculative commodification come from the below, I witnessed that they were strictly encouraged and actually orchestrated by the Justice and Development Party and its local branches and networks. So what I, what I argue is that um, the incitements to invest on property uh, by the AKP and its local networks uh, took place under the patronage of the party states in Yusufili. And one bigger idea that uh, comes from this is that uh, hegemony is made and unmade in these efforts to prepare for and chart the uncertain future in monetary terms. So um, the interesting thing was that AKP networks, AKP politician, uh, the mayor, the National AKP politicians who originally come from Yusufili or from this region were very instrumental in securing and advancing the investments uh, of those residents loyal to the party and its uh, politics. And this, I argue, constitutes a relation of consent. Just to um, give you one example, for example, uh, during the construction boom in Yusufili in 2015-2016, at one point, the State Department of Hydraulic Affairs, um, the SAE, which oversees all, all hydropower projects in Turkey, uh, began to complain about this construction boom, um, simply because the amount of compensation payments uh, to be paid to the residents was skyrocketing. And actually, they at some point passed the ban on new constructions. And they even took the photos of the town center with um, satellites and said that, you know, if your uh, building has not been completed before this date, we are not going to uh, pay you compensation. Of course, the, there were like several buildings that were half finished at that point, And many people went to contact the mayor to find a solution. And actually, uh, the mayor, through his contacts with the uh, national party uh, politicians, uh, maybe with Erdogan himself, I don't know, he actually circumvented this ban twice. And actually, in the end, those people who were very worrying about receiving full compensation uh, did get their money. So what I'm saying is that the success of conservative nationalist political projects based on economies of construction and destruction relies partly on the management of ordinary residents' attempts to endure and make a profit out of capitalist development's effects of, effects of destruction. Now, I'm very much aware that this uh, relation of consent is not universal or is not... Uh, happening everywhere in Turkey, in many parts of Turkey, obviously violence, obviously force is what the party state resorts to, to be able to actually realize this dispossession and displacement from Turkey's Kurdistan to the certain uh, shanty towns in, in, let's say, big uh, cities in Turkey. But uh, in Yusuf Ali, violence wasn't an option. Violence wasn't an option because, as I said, the this Turkish Sunni majority town, which was very loyal, at least for a very long time, very loyal to the AKP, was supporting AKP wholeheartedly for the most part. Uh, they, for them, uh, resorting to violence was not an option. So uh, governing this population, this community uh, in this part of Turkey as a such 
uh, took the form of a relation of consent. But um, having said that, I'm arguing in the book, I'm not going to go, go to that here, but um, despite all that, violence still remains the invisible background condition of this uh, relation of consent. And here I'm talking about uh, the other forms of ruination and accumulation that happened in this part of Turkey, just like um, other parts of Turkey. Um, that is the uh, dispossession and displacement that took place uh, during and after the Armenian genocide. So one entire chapter is about that, but I don't have time to go through that right now. So put it differently, the strategies of accumulation and commodification orchestrated through the interventions of the party state are what is behind the interruption of politics in this resource frontier. And as I said, uh, what was so interesting to see uh, was that those national politicians, national AKP politicians who have origins, who originally or whose families come from this region, were very instrumental in um, <clears throat> creating anticipations for the future and kind of, uh, kind of, convincing people for generation generating this um consent for for this capitalist developments um and here i'm kind of come came up with something called conservative commons with regards to that so in the end uh what i call bulldozer capitalism uh simply refers to the system of power profit and hegemony that comes to be formed and reproduced through the destruction and recomposition of the physical environments and um and here i'm interested in this dialectical relation between ruination and accumulation uh annihilation and recomposition and uh, like bulldozer here is kind of a bit of an um, unusual metaphor like when we think of bulldozer the first thing that actually comes to our mind is you know destruction devastation etc but as I also saw it on the fields, you know, one actually carries sand with bulldozer, one actually helps to build things with bulldozer. So I'm actually playing on this on this dialectical, or I'm using the image of bulldozer to actually look at the relation between these two sides, like destruction and construction, ruination and accumulation, so on and so forth. Just last two minutes. Um, now, we finally zoom out of Yusuf Ali or Turkey a bit. What is this book about then? Well, I'll say that um, it is really about the generation of consent amid the experiences of different forms of crisis, like social, economic, or ecological crisis. Um, all of us, regardless of whether we are living in Turkey or Hungary or India or the US, we are all interested in um, trying to understand how the authoritarian regimes actually uh, manage to uh, manage to control and manage to garner the support of those communities on whose lives uh, they actually wreak social, economic, and environmental havoc. And there are very different explanations for that. Some people say, you know, it's physical force is the most important aspect here. Remember Althusser's repressive state apparatuses. Some academics, some scholars, some colleagues write about poor relief strategies. Some write about welfare strategies. Some write about false consciousness. Some emphasize on the role of religion and nationalism. My answer, my very partial answer, is that this powerful incitement to negotiate and invest in ruination and destruction is actually an understudied yet crucial aspect of how authoritarian regimes elicit consents, um, how they form this new form of consensual political practice. Um, and here, um, I won't talk much about it, but what is fundamental for me, what I discuss more detail in the book, is precisely this cultivation and direction of an entrepreneurial subjectivity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Evran, for this wonderful and very, obviously, very timely talk. 
um, it's an honor for me to comment on your book, Bulldozer Capitalism, which I have followed uh, very closely and been inspired by uh, through its many stages, actually. Um, taking part in this event is a thrill, but it's also heart heartbreaking for me to talk about renation in the Choruh Valley, especially these days. Uh, Yusuf Ali is also um, the site of my long-term ethnographic fieldwork on environmental politics of infrastructure construction. And unfortunately, the town center is currently being submerged under dam waters at this very moment in these very days. Uh, when I was last there in January 2023, a couple of months ago, the dam had already started to hold back water, gradually submerging, uh, submerging nearby roads, villages, houses, uh, vegetation, land, and uh, animal barns. Meanwhile, the town center had turned into a place of material dissolution as buildings were first moved out, then dismantled, and then finally torn down. Uh, the economy of rubble and recycling and the conflicts around dismantling process had dominated everyday conversations. And today, three months later, the reservoir is nearly full, rising towards the hills where the resettlement site is located. So this is the context uh, within which uh, things are happening in Yusufili today. Bulldozer capitalism takes us back to those days when the submergence was still a future yet to come. Uh, in this empirically grounded and conceptually stimulating study, uh, the author explores in rich detail the conditions under which anti dam politics become interrupted and the resistance is transformed into consent and negotiation. From its beginning until its conclusion, the, bo the book tackles with a puzzling question, which was also stated in the talk, and I'm quoting, why did this semi-rural community gradually begin to give consent and take part in, a very, in the very project that would result in its economic dispossession and involuntary displacement. By tracking the answers to this question, the book foregrounds the experiences of those people who in time distanced themselves from resisting and turned toward a political practice of negotiation to endure ruination. By putting them at the center of this ethnography, the author challenges the invisibility of those communities that cannot be easily categorized as marginalized or subaltern, both in critical scholarship and in social movement activism circles. The book offers rich insights into new ways of understanding capital accumulation, dispossession and ruination in an accessible yet thought-provoking manner. Throughout the ethnography, the reader becomes closely acquainted with the ways in which Yusufeli residents, while waiting for their own destruction, employ everyday practices and discourses of simultaneously, quote, looking forward and looking back, unquote, to make sense and profit from the ruination of their own life space. Among them are individuals such as the Imam of a local mosque who expresses frustration over the repeated delays of the dam project and a desire to plan for the future, as well as villagers who construct new greenhouses and barns primarily as assets that could be liquidated in the form of compensation payments in the future. Critical disaster studies have aptly shown the mechanisms through which the political and economic elite, elite leverage disasters and crises and destruction for further capital accumulation and reproduction of power. The book, I think, advances this literature by showing that making a profit out of the destructive effects of capitalist development is also forged from below by the desires, aspirations, and practices of ordinary people. Yet, bulldozer capitalism also pushes back against approaching useful residents as isolated subjects. The book presents a nuanced analysis showing that the emergence of entrepreneurial subjects in Yusufili aiming to benefit from destruction does not actually happen in a historical or political void. Rather, it consistently contextualizes the conditions under which residents accommodate to ruination through a multi-layered and multi scalar analysis. Each chapter of the book delineates the complex structures of power and spatial and temporal dynamics within which residents' own practices of valuation, investment, and speculation take shape. The book delves into various contextual factors in that sense, 
including the withdrawal of international consortiums from the dam project due to the successful anti-dam resistance, resulting in the nationalization of the project. It also explores the rise of AKP and its regime based on the energy, construction, and infrastructure sectors, as well as its appeal and um, political patronage at the local level in Yusufeli. The author also explains the use of paralegal arrangements facilitated by the party state to forge investment in incentives amidst reunion. It also explores the long lasting and several interruptions in dam construction, the protracted temporality of ruination, and the indebtedness and precarity of life, all contributing to the production of Yusuf Ali residents' own ways of enduring the drastic changes in their lives. Furthermore, the book highlights multiple ext extractivist projects of dispossession in the same region ranging from small hydropower plants to mining projects to dissolution of agriculture and farming, as well as the legacies of past violence against the valley's Armenian communities as part of the conditions under which the idea of turning ruins into commodity gains traction. These complex political and spatial temporal dynamics configure the conditions out of which the conservative nationalist AKP regime garners support through orchestration of ordinary citizens' desires for capitalist development. The result is an intricate account of the ways in which the dialectic interplay between destruction and construction, annihilation and accumulation, hence bulldozer capitalism, shapes simultaneously the everyday lives in a resource frontier and the making of an authoritarian party state regime at the national scale. Environmental conflicts and infrastructural development have, have been rising topics of scholarly analyses of social, political, economic, spatial, and material transformations in Turkey and also beyond. The author makes a crucial intervention in this scholarship by not stopping the analysis where and when the social socio-environmental resistance on the ground stops. The rich literature on environmental justice movements in Turkey has recently offered path-breaking insights upon which the author's work has also been built. However, the lack of attention to communities who do not actively oppose ecological injustices and destruction has left a significant and prevalent phenomenon under, underexplored. By shedding light on the afterlife of a dam, uh, uh, sorry, by shedding light on the afterlife of and anti-dam resistance in northeastern Turkey, bulldozer capitalism overall offers a refreshing understanding of how and with, with, with which effects politics get interrupted and reconfigured. So I'll stop my uh, commentaries here and uh, raise two questions I have in my mind, my, one conceptual and other methodological. And then I, we will open the floor for questions uh, from the audience, so I, I encourage everyone to type their uh, questions in the chat if uh, you haven't done so already. And um, after our discussion, I will read them in the order they are received. So my first question to Dr. Evran is about bulldozer capitalism, the striking title and one of the intriguing core concepts framing your work. As you explained also in the talk at the very end also, the image of bulldozer illuminates so well the coexistence and co-production of destruction and creation, accumulation and dispossession. Um, when this powerful metaphor or image of bulldozer is combined with capitalism, two slightly different meanings can emerge, I think. And I'm curious to hear which one is the way you use the term actually. Um, does the metaphor, the image of bulldozer describe a general characteristic of capitalism, pointing to a larger argument on all forms of and projects of capitalist development and how they bring together these dialectical uh, relationships? Or does bulldozer capitalism indicate a specific form of capitalist accumulation through big infrastructure projects, particularly dams? which you call, uh, I think beautifully, uh, the cement megawatt complex. 
Uh, if so, if the second one is more uh, akin to what um, how you use the term, could you address the role of materiality of hydropower dams in shaping bulldozer capitalism in particular ways? And I think I will um, go to, I will give you the chance to answer the first question and then we will uh, continue with the second one. Thank you so much, Ekin, for um, so, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, so nicely responding and so nicely um, engaging with my work. Um, now, it's a difficult question. I mean, I'm tempted to say that, yes, you know, we know from Schumpeter to David Harvey that, you know, creative destruction, what they call creative destruction in different contexts, maybe in a partly different way, has been uh, the motor engine of capitalist development, actually, historically speaking. So uh, when I use bulldozer capitalism, I say that uh, keeping that literature or those discussions in mind. But at, at the same time, um, yes, I guess I am more interested in the how infrastructural capitalism actually has or is built on this dialectical relation between destruction and accumulation and ruination and accumulation and so on and so forth. Um, I'm tempted to say yes to like, or rather it's, I would, I'm tempted to say it's not an either or thing, but I think uh, like I didn't think of this book as like a very uh, like a big theoretical intervention of sorts. I didn't think of this book as a theory book, if you like. So I think I would say that or um, my main concern uh, was probably to move beyond this tendency in those literatures on Turkey and other places that you just mentioned to just uh, focusing on the destruction part or the dispossession part or the displacement parts and actually to think uh, of the other side in relation to, to these processes of destruction and ruination. And thank you. The book really does a very, very good job in illuminating the other side of the picture that you mentioned. Um, also, I had a second, rather more um, methodological or empirical question um, to raise before, before we move on uh, with the Q&A. Um, your book, I think, illustrates, of course, the significance of studying with people whose ideological and political perspectives does not really align, does not necessarily align with those of the researcher. And um, you describe in detail your own positionality in the book and some of the challenges of conducting ethnographic fieldwork among the conservative nationalist Sunni Turkish residents of Yusuf Ali and proponents of uh, the current regime. In that section, um, you also note that some leftist scholars and activists even criticized you for, um, I'm quoting, doing research with, with fascists, end of quote. And um, in these challenging conditions, I'm curious to know what the epistemic and political significance was for you to persist in conducting this research in Yusuf Ali. Um, I'm particularly interested in hearing your thoughts on this significance given the widely circulated and in my opinion, highly problematic critique uh, or discourse in Turkey that uh, about the communities who make up the AKP's constituents as subjects who deserve environmental ruination and destruction because of, specifically because of the consent they have given to or the votes they have uh, given to. So how does your book, how do you see your book responding to those critiques? Um, let me start with this. My uh, doctoral dissertation, my fieldwork research for my doctoral dissertation was uh, took place mostly in Istanbul, even though I had also some visits in um, Ankara and Izmir. But it was very much based in this urban setting. It, I, I was doing with research with 
people uh, that I agree with, that I politically align, like anti-militarists, conscientious objectors, LGBTQ activists, um, so on and so forth. And uh, I also obviously learned a lot from them. But already, I, as I was writing my dissertation, I was also um, becoming aware of the limits of simply doing research in the midst of people that we like or that we politically agree. And actually, um, already vaguely, I had somewhere in the, at the back of my mind uh, at that point that actually I want to do research in rural Turkey and, you know, with other kinds of people or with people with other political opinions. And what was so interesting uh, in this context uh, was that Yes, the anti-dem activists, the anti-displacement activists, you also know them, uh, were people whom I would describe in other contexts as fascists, like and uh, and with you know coming from certain political ultranationalist political tra traditions and political parties, uh, have been involved in certain acts of political violence, maybe, and um, this was not easy obviously but and as you said yes i also had some doubts i also um had ups and downs during my fieldwork research uh emotionally there were times uh where it just became too challenging to observe witness to follow um some terrible news coming from other parts of turkey and to just you know be continue uh, being uh, with these people and not being able to talk about these issues openly with them so there was that but at the same time um i guess this is the beauty of fieldwork research or long term fieldwork research obviously all this changes us uh, right um so at the same time i'm still very close to some of those people um, at a personal level that, as I said, I would call in other occasions as fascists, which is not an easy thing to say, which is not an easy thing to accept. But I think this is part of what we do. And um, and just for the record, I also tell my German students that, you know, obviously go on the streets and beat up the neo-Nazis. But if you are going to do research, then you are at an, another uh, position and you also need to have another state of mind if you want to do that properly. And we know that there are also very good ethnographies like uh, Nitsa and Schoen's, uh, book, Ethnography with Neo-Nazis. So there is that. Um, when it comes to, yes, as you said, yeah, you know, you know they vote for the AKP and for that reason, um, you know, they should suffer kind of uh, common discourse, common narrative that we hear a lot. Um, well, um, I guess one of the points that I want to make is that, well, uh, you know, it's not because they have a false consciousness or it's not because they are stupid or it's not because they are only conservative or nationalist or religious that they support the AKP, but actually it is because precisely the party, the party state is or was so able to forge these connections and to precisely give this uh, appearance that actually they can survive, they can actually make a profit out of the destruction that is happening to them. Um, and uh, witnessing, you know, the fact that, you know, they were about to, and now they lost so many things, material and immaterial things, uh, in the course of a very long process, like something that took 20, 30 years, um, something that was very much predicated on slow violence, actually. Um, you know, um, this is, I guess, uh, what I want to emphasize on what I want to pinpoint. And this is actually precisely like, if there is one more general point that I'm making about AKP or Turkey or whatever is that, you know, no, they shouldn't suffer. No, it's not because they are stupid or it's not because they are religious, but there's something else that's going on here. That's, I studied in Yusuf Ali, but that is, I think, to a certain degree, uh, generalizable or applicable to what's happening or what was happening in other parts of Turkey for the past 10, 20 years.
Thank you for this um, informative and important answer, actually. So um, the floor is now open to questions from the audience, and I'm going to read the first one. But I also want to say that if you want to read uh, or speak your question yourself, um, please raise your hand by using the reaction um, tool uh, at the bottom of the screen, and I will make sure to give uh, the floor to you. Otherwise, I'm happy to read it from the chat as well. Um, so the first question comes from Bilge Yabancı, and she says, uh, thank you so much for this amazing talk. I have not read the book yet, but I wanted to ask clarification about the statement that violence was not an option. Why? If not violence, nonviolent campaigns is, was always an option. Many other environmental justice mobilizations, as well as labor mobilizations, women gender mobilizations utilize them. They become successful in stopping projects and legislation against right violations. I can think of strategic use of courts, sustained public awareness campaigns, protests, pickets, sits in, um, in big cities, etc. So I wonder how the author uh, makes sense of the fact that some mobilizations invented ways to contest projects, but others, like in Yusufeli, did not. Many thanks, and I'm done. Um, just to clarify, when I said that violence was not an option, it was an option. It was not an option for the state or for the party state. So uh, what I meant was that whereas the AKP regime, the AKP party state resorted to violence in Kurdistan or, as I said, in many other parts of um, Turkey to displace or dispossess uh, different communities, mostly ethnically and uh, religiously marginalized communities here, because this was a Turkish Sunni majority place, which has very close connections to the party and which is very loyal to the party. like. Uh, for a very long time, AKP was receiving 60, 70 percent of the votes uh, from Yusuf Edi. And for that reason, uh, and also because Yusuf Edi actually as a town has uh, many connections, has historically many connections to the central government, like, you know, they always pride themselves for uh, having this or that high-ranking bureaucrat or a governor or a minister or something like that. Because of these connections, uh, using violence, resorting to uh, the kinds of force that the AKP uh, used, utilized uh, in many other places was not an option. That's what I meant. And that for that reason, you know, that should, there had to be some kind of generation of consent, production of consent. Did I answer it? Um... So the other question we have uh, is from Anush Suni, who is also uh, a postdoc at Cayman program. And Anush says, uh, thank you so much for this stimulating discussion. I would, uh, I would like to ask the author to expand on his formulation of how earlier forms of violent dispossession, particularly the Armenian genocide, relate to these recent processes of dispossession. Well, it's both materially and immaterially uh, related. Um, well, first of all, I discovered at some point that um, some of those parcels of land, some of those gardens, some of those buildings in the town center that the current residents uh, were then, uh, you know, speculating on or were expecting to liquidify uh, to receive compensation payments actually belong to the um, Armenian residents of this part of Turkey. Um, so in that sense, uh, the past ruination or the past, the relation between ruination and accumulation in the past uh, and in the present kind of got uh, intertwined in very interesting ways. But also, uh, I realized at some point that everyone or many people including these very ultranationalist figures, ultranationalist residents, were invoking the dead Armenian. Like they were, some of them were very problematically saying that, yeah, you know, like we will just be displaced, we will be displaced just like the Armenians uh, about uh, 100 years ago, 
or we will also need to leave our homeland just like the Armenians did a hundred years ago. So somehow, uh, like effectively, uh, there was there was this thing that like the, you know this entire process was kind of bringing back the dead Armenian at least discursively. Um, so I'm kind of on the one hand um, arguing that uh, in many ways. Uh, this Armenian genocide and the violent disposition and violent displacement that took place in 1915 and afterwards, uh, in many ways, kind of constitutes the originary accumulation and originary violence in this part of Turkey, just like the rest of the country. But at the same time, I'm arguing that, you know, this violence, the memory of this violence, also um, become something around which several of these tensions become crystallized actually, that it actually um, somehow um, stirs, somehow activates different kind of effects, like, you know, we know from yeah, Navarro's work. Um, and third, I'm saying that um, to refer to my good friend and colleague, Elisa von Bieberstein's work, you know, this racialized property regime, that is still a very big issue because once again, just like in any other part of uh, Anatolia, many people from Yusuf Ali were also engaged in treasure, what they call treasure hunting, namely digging and unhurting those artifacts, those properties, those money that used to um, belong to Armenians. So in different ways, like um, the the, the violent dispossession of the past, the originary uh, violence, the originary um, accumulation kind of makes a comeback or kind of in quite inter intricate ways get intertwined with the dispossession and displacement that's hap that is happening or that was happening um, at the time I was doing research. And we have another question from Ulaş Erdoğdu, um, who says, thank you very much for the talk. I wondered the role of local elites and politicians from opposition parties in these processes. How did their interaction with the representatives of the government party and the local population impact uh, what you actually um, talked about? Well, um, I mean, when it comes to when it came to interacting with, let's say, the government or the uh, state, I think you know they were pretty much sidelined. By the way, when we talk about opposition, it's JHP in this context. Like there is virtually no other opposition party. Um, but more interestingly, or at the same time, um, many of these people were also uh, part of the speculative. Uh, projects of investments. Like I also met some contractors who were hardcore JHP supporters, and they were also um, taking part in the uh, in the uh, construction boom that was taking place uh, around this time. And at least with the local mayor, AKP mayor, they you know had some connections. And just like all the other contractors, they went and try to you know, find solutions for their problems if their property was not entirely completed when they say uh, past the span, you know, they also said that you, know, you should find a solution for this problem. Um, but other than that, um, what was also interesting was that, for example, JHP or JHP people for the most part were not the most visible anti-dam, anti-displacement activists, actually. Um, they, they're, they throughout, like within these 10, 15, 20 years, they kind of try to come up with sort of alternative solutions, like let's have a, build a satellite town somewhere during this process, or let's do this and that. But it wasn't anything more than coming up with alternative visions of development, if you like. They weren't really visibly interested in stopping the dam project or you know, finding a solution about uh, the displacement or something like that. 
maybe Ardam, if you uh, allow me, I can um, sure, ask please. you what you think, just on, on uh, building on that. Uh, you know, how do you interpret the fact that in the last local elections, the opposition parties, which was a very surprising uh, development uh, in Yusuf Ali, that the opposition parties almost uh, won the election and then there was a repeat election um, in the town when uh, and only after that repeat election, the AKP was able to win. So maybe was that an indication of the cracks and limits uh, of this capitalist developmentalist aspirations um, going on in the town? Because you also kind of mentioned some of the cracks um, of this project. Um, the you know of, um, the orchestration of aspirations for development having some of some some limits or not being a complete process um, in terms of the opposite the role of opposition parties not necessarily pushing back against uh, capitalist developmentalism or the dam project but uh, at least being able to open a crack uh, in the power of the political party in the locality. Absolutely. I mean, I think there were different reasons for JHP's almost success or partial success. I mean, first of all, uh, the uh, kind of alliance between E Party and JHP during that election, I think, in, in Yusuf Ali had a great impact. So what happened was that uh, many people uh, in Yusuf Ali, many people, many nationalist, conservative, whatever people who once belonged to, uh, who were once either members of AKP or other uh, nationalist right-wing political parties um, around this election or right before this election, um, I observed that many of them were drawn to the orbit of E-Party or even actually several of them uh, became the founders of the E-Party, the local uh, branch of E-Party in the town. Um, so there was including former AKP members actually and including you know prominent wealthy contractors, landowners, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that had an effect. Um, but also, I think, yes, so this was, I think, more or less um, right after when the expropriation start, uh, process started in some of the villages, not everywhere, and certainly not in the town center, but definitely in the villages. And actually, it was also the time when, you know, uh, it became clear that this form of speculative investment or accumulation is in the end of the day very speculative and actually one didn't make much of a money by building these greenhouses or barns or something like that. Uh, in the end, I mean, I also talk about the end of this, if you like, um, sort of the, you know, who, who ended up as becoming the winners and losers of, of, of this, of this game. And as far as I could see in the villages, uh, only those few landowners who owned huge parcels of land actually made some profits and made some money. But those others with uh, really very small parcels of land, which is the majority for, um, for Yusuf Ali and his villages, actually not only lost their uh, land and houses, but they actually ended up with very little amount of compensation payments. So I think that also uh, played a role. And third, uh, JHP's candidates in that election was a very good one. Uh, a young lawyer, um, a very uh, likable guy. So I think also that played a role. Um, thanks a lot. So um, another question comes from Duygo Avji. Um, she is very intrigued, intrigued to, read, to read the book. Uh, and her question is, if we are talking about people investing in houses and barns, et cetera, in expectation of future compensation, and assuming that they indeed received that compensation payments, can we still think of them as being dispossessed? And I would imagine those who were able to invest in these speculative uh, in these speculative ways repossession were already people with resources. Uh, what about people who could not be enticed into speculating for lack of resources? How the consent of these people was organized? 
Great question. I mean, I think it's still this position because in the end of the day, um, all these people had to go somewhere and that is the new settlement area. And how it works is that uh, if you happen to own a house or a flat or something like that, uh, that gets expropriated. You get a certain amount of money, but that is deducted from the amount of money that you need to pay for the new flat in the new settlement area. So in the end of the day, uh, you become a uh, lifelong indebted uh, homeowner, homeowner in the new settlement area. So um, in that sense, uh, and even also you have to um, keep in mind that, um, I mean, yes, some of the people invested in these houses, bought new houses, whatever, but uh, when there was also a time that passed between when these new flats, new uh, buildings were constructed and when the compensation and expropriation process started, let's say five years, six years. And these um, depreciation, what are called depreciation uh, rates are also taking into consideration. The age of the building also matters. So yes, it's not like they ended up with nothing, but uh, if, they're, if they were lucky, they become home owners in the new <clears throat> settlement area, but uh, they, had to, they have to pay um, lots of money for the next 15, 20 years. So, and I think this is some kind of disposition in the end of the day. Now, those people who don't um, own anything, and this basically includes maybe 70, 80% of shop owners who don't own, the, uh, own their shops. Um, this was something else. I didn't talk much about uh, in this, but um, in addition to uh, investments, um, what also mattered was negotiation. So pretty much all my, uh, or I spent lots of time trying to understand the different forms of negotiations or different hopes for negotiation that were taking place in the town, precisely between these shop owners who owned absolutely no, no property and the um, AKP <clears throat> politicians from the mayor to the, um, you know, then Istanbul Mayor Kadir Topbaş, who actually comes from this region, to Erdogan when he shows up in the town. And precisely for a very long time, they came together. They, at some point, established their own local association of shop owners, and they came up with a number of demands. You know, you help us with this. You help us with the move. Uh, we get a total sum. You uh, declare this uh, our town a disaster area so that uh, we get some tax breaks and we get some additional money and aids and those promises made by the party state and its local representatives and the mayor also similarly built anticipations for the future which also is part of what i call this like consensual uh form of politics um so yes negotiation uh, was a very big uh, part of the is very is is the answer um, or building forms of negotiation. I mean, once again, in the end, they didn't get anything, almost anything. But for a very long time, uh, and also thanks to these people like Faruk Celik, something minister from AKP who comes from this town, and Kadir Topbash who comes from the neighboring valley, uh, they. They trusted these people. And this is actually what I um, try to mean by conservative commons. They mobilized conservative commons, if you like, to be able to establish this sense of trust and um, yeah, consent. Um, Arda, maybe um, I can add to that uh, question by asking about the Roma community in Yusuf Ali. Uh, uh, what are they called again? Uh, uh, Roma community in Yusufili, they are. Yeah, they are called something. It's a very discriminatory term. Term, yes. mm -hmm. uh, term, which I don't even want to uh, mention mm -hmm. in, in quotes, but uh, you know um, about them. So, um, how about them? You know, in in addition to store store owners, we know that they are very. Um, uh, the poor uh, lower class members of the community, 
who don't necessarily also share the political ties. Uh, maybe some of them do, but uh, most of them not. And then um, again, in my time in Yusuf Ali, I kept hearing and uh, discourses about how the Yusuf Ali residents, for example, in the new resettlement site, do not want to be neighbors with um, the members of the Roma community um, in the town. So, so their kind of dispossession comes from, again, from top down, but also bottom up. Um, and their ways of navigating the changes, whether you were able to have an access uh, to talk with them and um, get an account of how they navigate uh, the process. I spoke to some members of the Roma uh, community in the town, uh, but uh, I think the ones that I, or some of them were already living in some villages and they owned some parcels of land, actually. They were not so worse off. And um, they were also expecting to get expropriation money, compensation payment, etc. But what I observe is that others, the poorer ones, um, I think were uh, very much involved in collecting the rubble and selling that, the remains uh, in those villages that had already uh, become submerged or half, half flooded or something like that. So uh, in many places, I saw them coming with their trucks and, you know, getting the, you know, um, I don't know, some metal frames and uh, whatever it's left, some pieces of wood, etc. So I think the part of this ruination economy or rubble economy or economy of the remains, whatever we want to call it, um, I think in that they were quite uh, instrumental. Um, I mean, there was, there was even the story that like one uh, guy, uh, one Roma guy was like going through some ruins and he found some money and, you know, he gave it back to the owner of that house. You know, there were all these stories, um, but that's pretty much what I know, actually. And yes, I mean, the uh, racism against them was um, obviously unbelievable. And um, Alice von Bieberstein, actually, before leaving, uh, had left a note. Uh, she says, I need to leave soon, but was quite struck once again by the references to history repeating itself and how it manifests as some twisted, disavowed recognition of the original dispossession beyond that sense of experiencing the same fate of displacement. Um, we can't talk it, about this yeah, with Alice. Or we've been talking about this with Alice forever. So um, her book is also coming out, and I, I think in another context, she also um, tackles um, some of these things um, that I mentioned, that I discuss uh, in one chapter with regards to Armenian genocides, and she obviously writes on other things. Um, we will definitely look forward to read uh, her book and maybe even to have a chance to discuss her book um, in, in future when it is out. Um, I am not able to see any questions on the chat. Uh, if there is any last minute question from the audience uh, raising hands or writing in the chat, um, we can um, ask that question or otherwise, uh, we are also reaching to the end of our time. Um, so I guess we can just uh, finish it here. And once again, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Evran, for sharing your amazing and important and very timely work with us today. And thank you to everyone who attended.